NAD levels, everybody's trying to increase NAD levels. And the best yeah. way to do that is probably calorie restriction, fasting, but you can't do that. A ketogenic diet really causes a nice elevation of NAD levels just by ramping really? up the TCA cycle. Yeah, so you can naturally produce, uh, restore even your NAD levels. So that's another project we're working on. Dom, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thank you for having me, Inka. Of course. So hi, everyone. I'm here with Dom Diagostino, who is an associate professor at the University of South Florida, teaching neuropharmacology, medical biochemistry, physiology, and neuroscience. And he's also a research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. And Dom, your lab focuses on metabolic strategies for targeting central nervous system disorders. Does this sound about right? And did I miss something here? Uh, that's right. Yeah, we look at nutritional therapies, we call them nutrition therapies, and metabolic therapies. Uh, but we look at metabolic drugs like, you know, metformin, which, you know, your listeners may be familiar with. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and we all, we use hyperbaric oxygen as a model to produce oxidative stress. So we look at mitochondrial antioxidants and various mitochondrial agents that can protect the mitochondria. Uh, that can include ketones, exogenous ketones, dietary therapies, and a, a toolbox of different drugs too. So not not just ketogenic diets. I think that's what maybe what people are know me for, but we study a range of different neuropharmacological interventions and metabolic interventions. Well, that's super interesting. Um, we can cover some of the things that you think are most relevant and interesting in the research at the moment. What are the like the latest findings and everything? And um, this will be I think this will be a very interesting discussion because there are we will cover, you know, new research on the ketones and nutritional ketosis, uh, some of the things that you just mentioned and um, their application to health disease, you know, Alzheimer's cognition and longevity. So let's start with uh, with like, how did you start studying all these things? I believe if if I'm correct, you started with the uh, research in ketones. So what made you interested in ketones? How, wh why did they stood out for you? Yeah, actually, if we take a little bit of a step back, uh, it actually started with looking at lactate for protecting the brain under hypoxia. So I did my PhD as a neuroscientist doing patch clamp electrophysiology and looking at the neuronal response to hypoxia using that technique where we measure membrane potential, input resistance, firing frequency, individual neurons and neurons in a network in a Petri dish or in a brain slice, like a hippocampal brain slice preparation. And in the process of looking at uh, hypoxia, we wanted to understand how we could preserve brain energy metabolism in the context of low oxygen uh, as it would pertain to uh, hypo hypoxia, which is low oxygen or ischemia, stroke, traumatic brain injury. So a lot of my time and effort in grant writing was focused on drugs. And many of the things that I was looking at was also geared towards preventing oxygen toxicity seizures, which limits the therapeutic potential of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And it's also a limitation for the military uh, using closed circuit rebreathers. The Navy SEALs and special operations use that. So they have these seizures that are associated with the neurotoxicity of diving very deep. So I spent probably, I don't know, five years just looking at drugs and then through connections in nutrition and other, the world of neurology, I connected with neurologists who were using the ketogenic diet as an anti-seizure neuroprotective strategy. So Dr. Jung Ro, Dr. Uh, John Freeman from Johns Hopkins, Dr. Eric Kossoff and others were using the ketogenic diet when drugs fail. So it was about 2008. I started steering my research away from drug therapy. We still do research on drugs and different, you know, mitochondrial antioxidant compounds, but a large majority of what we do is formulating different types of ketogenic diets and really focusing on mechanistically how ketones work at the level of the cell from 
neurotransmitter mechanisms, mitochondrial function and things like that. And that was about 2008. And the first grant that I got, well, they hit about two times. I got one from the Alzheimer's Association, and that was a collaboration with a CEO of the center here. And then we got a grant from the Office of Navy Research, which is part of the Department of Defense to look at warfighter performance and resilience in extreme environments. So that's the timeline. <laughs> Wow, that's a lot of different aspects of the ketones. Um, maybe clarify to us ketones and uh, what is the difference between ketones and nutritional ketosis and exogenous ketosis or ex exogenous ketones? Yeah, good question. Uh, because people in the medical world still do not really know <laughs> the difference between diabetic ketoacidosis and then nutritional ketosis. But if we take a step further back, the ketones as a, a chemical bond are ubiquitous in nature. So they are found in many different plant-based compounds and in our bodies. Uh, our bodies make uh, ke like raspberry ketones, for example, are ubiquitous. Uh, ethyl acetoacetate is what makes flowers smell fruity. So that is a ketone molecule that's in, uh, but when we, as physiologists and, and biochemists, when we talk about ketones, we are specifically talking about the ketone bodies that are produced from fat oxidation. And that includes beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and uh, acetone, which you can smell on someone's breath if they're in. And they function as water soluble, uh, breakdown products of fat that can preserve brain energy metabolism in the face of fasting. Uh, they become their evolutionary role is probably to preserve energy to the central nervous system in the context of fasting. So when we stop eating, we liberate all the glucose in, in our liver and glycogen. And then our body is burning fat at a relatively high rate, but the long chain fats cannot readily cross the blood brain barrier to preserve brain energy metabolism. So through beta oxidation of fatty acids in the liver, the ketones are generated in the liver. The liver lacks an enzyme called succinyl CoA transferase. So the liver cannot use the ketones as an energy source. So those ketones spill into circulation and they energize the heart, they energize different organs, our skeletal muscle, but the brain is probably the biggest consumer of ketones. So being in ketosis, fasting ketosis, allows us to fast for extended periods of time over one week, two weeks, in the literature, even up to 40 days or more of fasting. Uh, and that would not, that is- Did you say four, like 40 days? 40 days, yeah. And that's largely attributed uh -huh. to our, if we didn't make ketones, we would die quickly within about a week and a half. So we can fast 500% 500, 500 longer. <laughs> and this is you know generally agreed upon by metabolic physiologists because of our ability to make ketones. So they provide brain energy, uh, but they also have anti-catabolic effects, meaning that when we have ketones in circulation, that prevents our muscle being broken down to liberate the gluconeogenic amino acids. So fat is converted to water soluble fat molecules called ketones and they energize the brain or they preserve brain energy metabolism. And they equally important is that they prevent the breakdown of skeletal muscle and also cardiac muscle. We would break down our heart. We would break down our skeletal muscle to liberate amino acids for glucose if we didn't make ketones. So that's one. And well, the ketone bodies interesting. are BHB what, what, what acetate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was very interesting. What did you just said about the, the muscle? Because one thing I believe it's like a common, I don't know, is this a myth when people say that you cannot build muscle on a ketogenic diet? And you just said that it helps muscle preservance. Anti-catabolic. Uh, there are some studies um, to show that in the context of sufficient caloric energy ketones can have anabolic properties uh in that context they can help they can help some forms of skeletal muscle regeneration in the context of an inflammatory uh pathway uh but for things that we study cancer cachexia we had a, a model of muscle wasting where we use something called lipopolysaccharide or lps and when we administer LPS in the context of ketones, the ketones have uh, a muscle sparing anti-catabolic effect. Uh, 
Uh, so they become very important in the context of an energy deficit. That energy deficit could be due to fasting or it could be due to a calorie restricted diet uh, and a calorie. That's why a calorie restricted ketogenic diet is very effective for weight loss and muscle preservation in the context of that. So uh, when it, when it comes to building muscle, the most important thing is to make sure you have enough protein. You know, I'm of the opinion that about 1.5 to 1.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is needed to build muscle. So that's the most important context for building muscle, but for maintaining muscle Mm. while you're losing fat, I personally think a calorie restricted ketogenic diet is the fastest way to do it. It may not be optimal for everybody, but is, is the fastest way to lose fat as fast as possible while preserving your uh, lean body mass. Wow. Well, that's very interesting. Besides muscle sparing in, in weight loss, that I think the research on nutritional ketosis and ketones has basically skyrocketed since the past six or seven years. Uh, in context, like, well, seizures have been studied for a long time, as you say, traumatic brain injuries, weight loss, Alzheimer's and even in longevity. So what's the like the overarching view on the conditions that ketogenic diet or ketones can help with? And maybe the other side of the coin is that why should we care about ketones when we don't have a disorder or disability? So I appreciate this is a big, big question, but like, you know, you can jump with it from your perspective as a ketone researcher and someone who has been on a ketogenic diet. Yeah. Uh, well, in 2008, when I was studying, when I got into looking at the ketogenic diet for oxygen toxicity seizures, which are a form of uh, a tonic clonic or what was historically called a, a grand mal seizure, the ketogenic diet produces a state of therapeutic ketosis that worked for a wide range of seizure disorders, uh, independent of the etiology, meaning that you could have a temporal lobe seizure absence seizures, all di- there's all different types, Lennox Gastaut syndrome, Deuce syndrome, you know, there's Dravet syndrome, there's many different types of seizure disorders, but they seem to be pathophysiologically linked to impaired brain energy metabolism. And in some cases, the data indicates that when you have a seizure, it increases inflammation in the brain, neuroinflammation. So I think the ketogenic diet has applications outside of seizures because it's changing the neuropharmacology of the brain. It's increasing the availability of ketones, which could preserve and restore brain energy metabolism. It's impacting a number of different inflammatory pathways that could be important for triggering different types of seizures or the impairment of glucose metabolism. So glucose hypometabolism is a hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. And, and there's different reasons for that. Uh, there's different transporters and enzyme systems, and also there's the, a vascular component. Another thing to factor in is that the ketones improve cerebral blood flow to the brain. And this has been measured and documented. Uh, acute ketosis as delivered with like a ketogenic agent can increase brain blood flow between 20 and 30%. And that's an acute time frame. That's within like uh, within an hour that brain blood flow can increase. Is this with the ketogenic diet or the exogenous ketones that are you talking about? You said ketogenic agent. That particular was referencing a medium chain triglyceride. And then further work has been done with different exogenous ketone compounds. And that could be a ketone salt or a ketone ester. But even prior to that... Uh, ketogenic diets were shown to, or even fasting, if you fast for like 24 hours or more, you actually have an increase in circulation to the brain, brain energy. And it could be, you know, your digestive system requires a lot of energy and blood for your organs and things like that. And also you have an elevation of different molecules within circulation that can improve brain blood flow. There's, there's a number of different molecules, nitric oxide. So nitric oxide synthase is increased in the context of fasting and, and other things. And that that's a, vaso, a vasodilator. It can relax blood vessels, and increase circulation. 
the thing that we observed in some of our metabolomic work is there's a molecule called adenosine and adenosine is remarkably elevated in the context of a ketogenic diet and also in the context of administering a ketone ester or a ketone salt with a combination of MCT, adenosine is something like two to threefold higher. And uh, if you were to inject adenosine, you'd have vasorelaxation, and, but a big increase in, in circulation overall, you'd have less vascular resistance. So I think that becomes an important factor in the efficacy of the ketogenic diet. Maybe that has not been appreciated in the past, but we're starting to shed some light on it with some of the mechanistic studies that we're doing. Uh, there's also an increase in an enzyme called glutamic acid decarboxylase, and that converts glutamate to GABA. And there's certain conditions where uh, one is oxygen toxicity seizures and probably other seizure disorders, but we need to look into that. Oxygen toxicity, definitely. But we studied a mouse model of Angelman syndrome and many neurodegenerative diseases are pathophysiologically linked to excess glutamate, and that includes Alzheimer's disease. And what, what has been shown by our studies and other people is that when you're in a state of ketosis, it increases the activity of GAD 65 and 67. So you get more conversion of glutamate to a brain stabilizing, calming GABA, which stands for gamma amino acid. So that, that is higher in circulation. It's also higher in the brain, including brain regions like the hippocampus. Is this maybe part of the reason why people say that during ketogenic diet, they feel very calm, they feel very collected, they feel more relaxed, uh, that, that there is increase in adenosine and GABA? Yeah, you know, I... I, I experienced that myself when I fast, and I think there are maybe things in food that can increase uh, anxiety or affect our mood, and that could be a histamine response from foods that we're eating. So it could be like an elimination diet. So that was my original view when, because people were emailing me that they had different psychiatric disorders, whether it be uh, a lot of anxiety, some bipolar and some depression, and this is early on. And now that that the field of metabolic psychiatry has exploded. And that's another area that we can talk about. But when we were, when we administer exogenous ketones to our rats, we do something called a gavage. A gavage is like tube feeding a rat. So we have like a little device and we stick it in the, in the back of the throat and we uh, administer a very precise amount of exogenous ketone, and that could be an MCT oil. So it could be a ketogenic fat, it could be uh, ketone salts, or it could be different types of ketone esters. We work with many different compounds. What we found pretty much across the board is that when we acutely put an animal into a state of ketosis, that they become easier to handle and they are visually subjectively much more calm. So my wife, she did her PhD in neurosciences at, in Budapest, actually in Hungary, and she's very interested in behavioral neuroscience. And she was telling me that the animals are considerably more calm and easier to hold when within 15 minutes of putting them into acute ketosis. So that's ketone wow. level from zero to a ketone level to three or four millimolar within the 15 minutes. And uh, she said, you know, we should study this. And so we got, a, we did a, a number of different experiments that we've published at least three or four publications showing the anxiolytic effects of ketones. Mm -hmm. And it's linked to somewhat to GABA, but also to adenosine. Adenosine has a, a calming effect. It activates a potassium channel and hyperpolarizes membrane potentials and things like that and calms, quiets down neurons that are hyper excitable. So that would suggest it's a roundabout way of answering your question. And sorry, I'm kind of long winded that, the okay. ketone, yeah. that acute ketosis independent of the diet seems to have a, an anxiolytic or anxiety reducing effect. Can you use uh, exogenous ketones in humans or has it been studied or have you, have you tried it to use exogenous ketones like MCT oil in humans to basically reduce anxiety? Well, over the years, I've been getting a lot of emails. The problem is that there are different types of ketone formulations on the market. Some of them are good and some of them are not good. A lot of research that we have done 
is actually using beta hydroxybutyrate in the racemic form, which means the, the D and the L. But the, the form of beta hydroxybutyrate that we produce most abundantly in the liver is the D enantiomer. Uh, there is a racemase enzyme that can convert a little bit of that to the L enantiomer. But a lot of the research that we've done is the D enantiomer, the racemic, which is D and the L. So we've gotten very beneficial effects from using these racemic compounds. Uh, we also developed an anti-seizure ketogenic agent that produces beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate in a one-to-one -one ratio. And that works at preventing seizures while other ketogenic compounds do not. So the point of me discussing this is that some exogenous ketones work for some applications and some exogenous ketones have no effect at all on different on you know on various applications. So for example, 13 butane diol, which is a ketogenic compound, and many of the ketogenic agents on the market now are actually 13 butane diol, and they're selling them more or less as ketone esters, but that's different from a ketone ester. 13 butane diol does not have any anti seizure uh, effects and really didn't, it can produce ketosis, but for reasons we don't completely understand, it doesn't have many of the therapeutic effects. It does seem to have really nice therapeutic effects in the context of reducing cancer growth and proliferation. So, is this something that is you, you can actually buy as like Amazon or yeah. online or? Yeah, like uh, you know, keto IQ product is one three butane dial. That that does not prevent seizures in our hands and does not have therapeutic effects. Well, it does have blood glucose lowering effects, so that could be beneficial. It does elevate beta hydroxybutyrate, but it need it does it through being metabolized in the liver, and that can produce potentially some toxic aldehydes that could have some problems. Whereas a ketone salt is just a monovalent or divalent cation like sodium, potassium, magnesium, uh, or calcium bound to beta hydroxybutyrate. And when we consume it, it liberates the electrolytes. So the electrolyte formulation that works best is similar to the product element, which is an electrolyte supplement. Uh, so if you get similar ratios to element of sodium, potassium, and, and magnesium, and you combine that with beta hydroxybutyrate as the carrier or the, the molecule. So you could deliver electrolytes and deliver beta hydroxybutyrate at the same time. So the product that I use is called Keto Start, which is electrolytes mm -hmm. bound to beta hydroxybutyrate. And it also has DBHB and LBHB. LBHB is sticks around in circulation longer and hits the various receptors, including the anti-inflammatory pathways. And that may have a more pronounced signaling effect. Whereas the D beta hydroxybutyrate can be metabolized quicker by the mitochondria to make energy. So a DL uh, beta hydroxybutyrate salt will deliver electrolytes, energize the mitochondria, and then the L beta hydroxybutyrate it takes a longer time for that to be metabolized, and that has the potential of inhibiting the NLRP3 inflammasome. It hits the various uh, signaling pathways. We think epigenetic signaling too, so that's a project that we're studying right now. Ketone molecules are epigenetic regulators through histone deacetylases, but also through a process called beta-hydroxybutyrylation, where they can directly interact with the histone. So that's a, a PhD project of my current student now studying Kabuki syndrome. So metabolism is very complicated. So you have metabolism as a means to increase TCA cycle inter intermediates like NAD. NAD levels, everybody's trying to increase NAD levels. And the best yeah. way to do that is probably, well, calorie restriction, fasting, but you can't do that. A ketogenic diet really causes a nice elevation of NAD levels just by ramping really? up the TCA cycle. Yeah, so you can naturally produce, uh, restore even your NAD levels. So that's another project we're working on. We will be looking at different forms of NAD, nicotinamide mononucleotide, and other drug-like compounds that can elevate NAD levels, and then compare that to exogenous ketones, specifically looking at the effects of NAD 
as a neuroprotective compound. So it's a different project that we're working on now. Yeah, that's very interesting. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, NAD is basically this molecule that has been linked to longevity. Its decline has been implicated to all hallmarks of aging. Uh, it's a coenzyme that activates energy production and anti-aging pathways. I actually have a full episode with Dr. Nicola Kunlon on NAD and how to increase it with uh, exercise and fasting and supplements. So if you're interested check that out as well and it's very interesting that ketogenic diet can be also or exogenous ketones can be maybe used as a longevity benefits let's actually go to the aging research and one of the things that for example for alzheimer's there's always the risk factor is the aging alzheimer's is a huge issue it affects over 10 percent of people over 65 years old it's one of the leading causes of death and the rates are just increasing it causes significant significant loss of just everyday functioning memory causes distress to family and we, we don't yet completely know how to counteract it we don't yet completely know like there is a great deal to unravel or uh, discover on what is the specific biological mechanism in Alzheimer's. But your lab has been also studying ketones and ketogenic diet in Alzheimer's. What are the possible applications of ketogenic diet or exogenous ketones in, in the context of Alzheimer's disease? How can we maybe counteract some of the things that's linked to the disease? Well, Alzheimer's disease is multifactorial, right? So there is a mm. combination of things. There are forms of Alzheimer's disease that are highly responsive to a metabolic intervention. And uh, mm. it's multifactorial, but one hallmark characteristic is glucose hypometabolism. And another term for that is insulin resistance in the brain or type 3 diabetes. This is different from the insulin resistance in the body, right? Yeah, type three diabetes and, you know, of the brain or insulin resistance in the brain has been talked about and written by a couple of different groups. But it, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, type two diabetes, uh, which is characterized as just having a blood glucose level above, you know, 126 milligrams per deciliter, you know, fasting, it, it's an arbitrary measure of it. But I think measuring insulin is, is more indicative of uh, the pathological state of uh, type two diabetes, and that's insulin resistance. But we don't measure insulin, insulin should be measured in a comprehensive metabolic panel, but we actually go by blood glucose. But if you were to measure insulin, you would be able to capture and identify an impending uh, type 2 diabetes before it happens. So let's say that. <laughs> but Alzheimer's disease and brain health in general are correlated, highly correlated with cardiometabolic bar biomarkers. That includes hemoglobin A1C, triglyceride levels, insulin, HSCRP. Uh, so these are the things that you need to focus on for metabolic health in general, because that will improve your brain health. But um, Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed typically after the person dies, but they do have an amyloid PET scan. Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed by the presence of amyloid beta plaques that form. There's also tau plaques that can form uh, secondary or, you know, correlates to the amyloid plaques too. And then there's Lewy body dementia, and then there's, you know, there's different forms of, of Alzheimer's disease. And it could be cause, you know, if you go and have mild cognitive impairment, that could be a result of vitamin B12 deficiency. So you want to check B12. There are certain infections that you may have, even Lyme's disease or syphilis or other disorders. There's, you know, HIV can cause a mild cognitive impairment. There's various things that you need to check. And these things probably cause neuroinflammation and neuroinflammation can cause brain fog and things that resemble Alzheimer's disease. And there is a whole bunch of tests that we can do to basically uh, behaviorally identify Alzheimer from the clock test to the mini mental state exam. And there's, I mean, about two dozen different tests that, that we can use. None of them are great, but when they're combined in general, they give a pretty good picture of it. But the the hallmark characteristic are the amyloid plaques and glucose hypometabolism, which can be done with an FTG PET scan. 
and uh, there are the 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 molecules that target the amyloid plaques do not seem to impact uh, the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. So there is a lot of doubt being shed on the amyloid hypothesis, and I've written about this on blogs and keto nutrition that you can look at. Uh, and it was in 2008 and here in Tampa, Florida, that I saw a news report of a woman who administered coconut oil to her husband, <laughs> and her husband improved on the mini mental state exam and the clock test, and it made front page of the paper. And I thought this was interesting. Okay, where is she being treated? Well, she was being treated at the Bird Alzheimer Center at the University of South Florida. And I knew the people, I knew the medical director there at the time and the CEO. And come to find out that this story was actually true. And uh, this woman, uh, her name is Dr. Mary Newport. And she administered coconut oil to her husband and then later found out that coconut oil is a, uh, within coconut oil are medium chain triglycerides, including caprylic triglyceride. So caprylic triglyceride was being sold as a drug from a medical foods company, and the molecule was called AC1202. And if you look at the patent, the, the sole ingredient of AC1202 was medium chain triglyceride, specifically the C8 or the capr caprylic triglyceride. This is the supplement that's been like sold in, in Amazon and the MCD oil, just a typical normal MCD oil and or C8 oil. That, that's right. Yeah. So this, this oh, dates okay, back before, well. you know, before brain octane was ever sold. I mean, we're going back into like the early 2000s, 2002, 2000, mm -hmm. you know, and I think in, in maybe in, even in the early or the late 1990s. So this caught my attention, this study using AC1202 and uh, the senior author who I, who I know well, Dr. Sam Henderson, and got the opportunity to talk to him and, and then read all the, the, the studies that he's been publishing on this. I became interested and had an appreciation for this idea that the ketogenic diet could work beyond epilepsy and that you could administer coconut oil or MCT oil and the MCT oil goes directly to the liver via hepatic portal circulation and then produces uh, about 20 to 30% of MCT becomes ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate. What was really interesting too is that when we give MCT to animals and we take out the hippocampus, that the MCT appears to cross the blood brain barrier and was actually in the brain tissue, the MCTs. So historically, from my nutritional training, we learned that fats don't cross the blood brain barrier. The glucose does and, right. you know, some amino acids and maybe short chain fatty acids, uh, you know, that's sort of debated. But uh, there was no doubt that, it, you, you know, that MCTs are crossing the blood brain barrier and can also function as an alternative energy source. So we did studies using an MCT-based ketogenic diet, and then it started a clinical trial to use an MCT coconut oil, uh, which we had to get an IND for that and like register it as a drug. It's kind of a, a circuitous pathway that you have to do uh, where you're starting as a food, but after you do all the paperwork, it becomes a, few, a food that's kind of labeled as an investigational new drug. Uh, the, the study didn't really get very far in terms of recruitment because when people learned what compound they were taking or not taking because they were a placebo, the, the, the loved ones and the caretakers just wanted to go to the health food store and buy MCT and give it to their loved one with Alzheimer's. They didn't want to take a placebo when they're reading the literature and showing that it has a positive effect right. on the majority of people. But it's so powerful. It. Yeah, it's, it's. Yeah. Well, I mean, powerful is that could be for some people are highly responsive. So I went, uh, Dr. Mary Newport was a guest speaker for some of my classes uh, in the Center for Aging and also my metabolism class. And I had the opportunity to know Steve, her husband, and I, I observed him consume a large dose of MCT and coconut oil. And I watched his tremor stop. And sometimes people with Alzheimer's disease start to get tremors and, and also can slide into Parkinson's or Parkinson's like disease tremors. And I watched his tremor stop. And I also watched him become more animated. And this was wow. 2009. Yeah. And that increased my enthusiasm for redirecting my research from drug-based research to looking at 
ketogenic diets, exogenous ketones, and actually incorporating MCT. And there's a lot of companies out there that may just study like one particular ketone ester, but we study all of them and we're kind of agnostic to any particular agent. But we think that there's real innovation in combining like a ketone salt with MCT because the MCT stimulates your mm -hmm. own ketone production through fat. And then at the same time, it slows and causes a sustained release of the exogenous ketone. So you get a better pharmacokinetic curve of the exogenous ketones that you formulate it with. So we're very interested in formulating very specific exogenous ketones uh, for different disorders. And that could be epilepsy, it could be Alzheimer's, it could be cancer, it could be brain injury, uh, a number of different you know, things. Uh, also, we look at genetic disorders. So even in the presence of a persistent molecular pathology, a ketogenic diet without necessarily changing the genome can uh, manage the disease process. And that happens in mm. glucose transporter deficiency. Uh, we're studying Kabuki syndrome, POMP syndrome. So we study a lot of rare disorders and seeing mm -hmm. how nutrition can work better than any drug that we know uh, really inspires us to, to really appreciate food as medicine. And there are, we study many different disorders where there are no drug treatments for it. And then ketogenic diets can manage that disorder. And I could go down the list, but I don't, I don't want to bore your listeners. <laughs> right. Sure. So I think this is very, very interesting and not boring at all. Actually, one thing I think many people struggle these days is this like experience of brain fog or just like wanting to enhance their cognition. And since the ketones can cross the blood brain barrier and clearly have some implications on brain health as well. Do you think that they can also boost cognition if you are not having Alzheimer's or other clinical condition? Yeah. Ketosis. I get this question asked a lot. I think, uh, much like, you know, things like everybody's using smart drugs and <laughs> different compounds that are stimulants like Adderall or modafinil, you know, different nootropic compounds. And I think a lot of these drugs are prescribed, for example, modafinil is prescribed when you're at a deficit, right? When you when you're lacking sleep, and I've used it very sparingly, like flying to Australia after I can't sleep on a plane, so two days of sleep deprivation, like you know, I've taken it before a talk or something like that, or when I'm crossing time zones, or you know, Adderall, which is used for kids who have legitimate ADHD. I think in the context of a medical condition or a specific situation where there's a deficit, these drugs work remarkably well. And I would say the same thing kind of works with nutritional ketosis and exogenous ketones. If you are under a lot of stress, uh, if you are sleep deprived, that's when I know, for example, if I'm traveling, sometimes I internationally, I'll fast for 24 hours and I'm much more energetic, aware, and my circadian biology is much more synchronized to the environment that I enter into, you know, if I fast prior to that and then uh, make sure I get out in the morning, get a lot of sunshine and then initiate eating during those sunlight hours. So exogenous ketones work really well for the things that we study, which is where you have a neurodegenerative disease, if you have a seizure disorder. And we're doing research now, but I, I can't really talk about it, where we put people under extreme environments and then we exercise them. We look at cognitive function. We look at reaction time. You know, the, the consensus of the data so far is that if you're hypoxic or if you're in an extreme environment, of like temperature or high levels of oxygen or various things that ketones work remarkably well. And that may be because uh, there are a variety of different bottlenecks when it comes to metabolizing glucose for energy. And that could be the GLUT1 transporter, the GLUT3 transporter, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which are all actually inhibited. Uh, GLUT3 and PDH are inhibited in Alzheimer's disease and many neurodegenerative diseases. Oh, wow. So that means like the glucose, glucose uh, utilization is not as effective. So ketones can sort of overcome this problem. Exactly. Yeah, that's well characterized in Alzheimer's disease is that there's a deficiency of the PDH enzyme, which is actually like the rate limiting enzyme for glucose metabolism in the brain. 
So there's a deficiency of that enzyme. And also the catalytic activity of the enzyme is reduced, even if you're producing it. And there's also an internalization of the GLUT3 transporter. So we have different glucose transporters throughout uh, the gut, you know, the GLUT1 transporter is on the blood brain barrier and there's, you know, the GLUT4 and the muscle, the GLUT3 tends to be most concentrated on the membranes of neurons and the GLUT3 protein levels are lower, but if you immunocytochemically look at the, the cells and you optically section the cells and look at the membrane, uh, what happens is that in, in the presence of Alzheimer's pathology that correlates with amyloid pathology, there's an internalization of the GLUT3 transporter, and that could be limiting glucose availability. Uh, and that could be caused by, you know, a vascular component or, or there's some evidence that neuroinflammation decreases some of these metabolic enzyme activities that when you have chronically elevated cytokines, IL-1 beta, IL-6, uh, TNF alpha, that these things wreak havoc on metabolic control and specifically metabolic control of mitochondrial glucose oxidation. And the remarkable thing about ketones is that you bypass all those enzymatic and even transporter stop blocks. You know, and when we talk, everybody's like in an extreme environment, like some people may have an autoimmune issue that causes systemic inflammation. Some people may be sleep deprived. Some people are under work stress. Some people are over exercising. So their body's in a state of hyper inflammation. So, uh, when you ask me about, you know, do ketones work for the average person? My response was, well, they, they'll work better in a pathological state, but I think we're all riding that fine line of, you know, uh, of inflammation and we're all pushing our bodies really hard mentally, physically. I know I am. And then when I start to feel, uh, you know, side effects of that, I back off a little bit, but when I'm in a state of ketosis, I can go above and beyond what I can without being in a state of ketosis. And that has, that's an operational advantage from a military perspective. And that's why we study it in the context of uh, performance resilience. So performance resilience mean that you can maintain the same level of cognitive and physical performance in an extreme environment if you're in a state of therapeutic ketosis. And I guess you could, you know, extrapolate that context to the average person really pushing hard. But at the same time, people that are older, especially over 60s, 70s, 80s, may have early signs. I mean, everybody's aging and NAD levels are also low as we age. So therapeutic ketosis is a way to ramp up the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle to produce more of these reduced intermediates, including NAD. That's an excellent clarification. I'm, I'm like very inspired by ketones at the moment. And I want to ask before my last question that, let's say I want to start using the power of ketones in my body but i just generally want to don't want to go to the hustle of designing a ketogenic diet just ramping up my fat and reducing carbs and i just want to somehow use my ketones sort of or use the ketones in my body to helping me with just general cognition and general health enhancing effects um what would be the like the practical approach like in um in addition to fasting to sort of uh, use ketones would it be to maybe use mct oil daily buy some sort of ketone salt ester what would you say is the good approach in such an everyday use of ketones yeah you know i've given kind of recommendations to a lot of people and what i find uh something that people will do and something that has real world objective measurable results is not to do a ketogenic diet. You might find that surprising to me. Uh, a ketogenic diet does have side effects. We know that we, when we implement a true ketogenic diet that's so restricted in carbohydrates and so high in fat, a lot of people don't tolerate it. And we have to ease people into it. In our current trial, we just finished. Uh, we do it. We transition the person after about four to six weeks. And most people can, but they typically need like a medical team or a support group to do that. So if someone wants to experience the potential, you know, benefits of ketones, I would suggest simply a low carb whole foods diet, something like a low carb Mediterranean diet. That's for example, under hundred grams of carbs a day, 
where uh, they're getting the large majority of their carbs from uh, from fibrous vegetables. So I am not of the opinion that vegetables, you know, veggies are toxic. I include them more of like a garnish. I am not a fan of a plant-based diet. I'm not a fan of a vegan diet or even a vegetarian diet. I, I'm a believer in an omnivorous diet that's a little more carnivore based. <laughs> I do my personal diet is just protein and fat in the morning, uh, protein and fat in the afternoon, and I'll have a small salad with fish, chicken or beef. And then I have usually some fruit at night, uh, including berries, we have avocados on the farm, you know, uh, so green leafy vegetables, a little bit of broccoli, asparagus, berries, things like that. Uh, and whole food sources of the meats, I think are, are super important sardines, eggs, oysters. I eat those foods almost every day. So these foods that are highly nutritious and have a very high micronutrient content with things like vitamin B12, you want to ensure carnitine, creatine monohydrate, I think is important. So getting back to your question, yeah, a low carb Mediterranean like diet, and then incorporate small amounts of MCT with food. So if you take MCT on an empty stomach, then the large majority of people will have uh, irritation to 20 to 30 milliliters of MCT on an empty stomach. Uh, so I would start with incorporating MCT into food. Another level to go to would be something like a ketone salt. Uh, Audacious Nutrition makes keto start. I use that and I incorporate that with an MCT based powder that's called Keto Brains. It's a C8 powder. It's got lion's mane in it. It's got alpha GPC and it's got theanine. So I use this two or three times a week on days that I have to do a lot of work, a lot of teaching and a lot of writing. I'll use the combination. I'll use keto start, which is an electrolyte formulation similar to the uh, element, but the electrolytes are bound to beta hydroxybutyrate. And then I'll use that product along with keto brains. And sometimes I'll put it in my coffee. Uh, I don't have it today, but later I've got to teach a, a, a pretty big class. So I'll probably, I'll probably use keto brains and some coffee to fuel that. Uh, so that would be a good entry point. So carbohydrates under a hundred grams and see how you feel. And then maybe drop it to 50 grams or lower, but some people don't do well on 50, less than 50 grams of carbohydrates. It makes them hungry and kind of irritable. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely one of those people. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I kind of get like that too. And if I'm getting a lot of beef and a lot of fish, if I switch my protein sources to turkey and chicken, that's higher in tryptophan, then I feel more relaxed. If I select protein sources, the protein source I found actually impacts my general mood. I'm kind of very dopaminergic. So I have like a lot of drive, too much drive. And if I switch right. to foods that are more uh, dominant in uh, tryptophan, uh, I could literally feel, and my, I did a lot of testing and my tryptophan levels were a little bit low and my serotonin was mm -hmm. a little bit low relative to dopamine and simply switching out and getting more poultry, getting more turkey. Uh, chicken is okay, but I prefer like turkey, uh, which they both have high levels of tryptophan. My tryptophan levels and serotonin levels balanced out just by switching some of my protein sources around. So if you do feel irritable and kind of, you know, you have a lot of angst, <laughs> maybe towards the end of the day mm -hmm. and you're kind of go, 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 uh, switching out your protein sources to sources that are more dominant in tryptophan uh, could be a way. I know it, it helped me for sure. Yeah, that sounds very logical and something that I've also noticed in my own diet. So one of the, the, the last questions that I wanted to just quickly visit, I know we cannot cover this very extensively, but um, you, you just mentioned metformin. So what kind of studies have you been conducted with metformin and maybe our greatest insights in, in like a few sentences with that one? Yeah, uh, I, a student of mine that's now at the Moffitt Cancer Center did his PhD under me studying the molecular effects of metformin. And we found that metformin has uh, a small, you know, barely significant reduction in blood glucose. And typically metformin works if your existing glucose level is high. Metformin will help to bring the glucose down. If you have normal glucose levels, metformin 
has very minimal effects really on reducing your mm. blood glucose. Uh, but most people have high blood glucose. So they'll probably see a five to 10% decrease in blood glucose with 1000 to 2000 milligrams per day of metformin. But we've also discovered and we've published that metformin is a mitochondrial, a mild mitochondrial toxin. So it, it actually increases wow, superoxide. Okay. Yeah, it increases superoxide production uh, in in the mitochondria and it has is a weak mitochondrial toxin. This is actually well known. And uh, we did a number of mechanistic studies to, to kind of further validate what some other people have documented. I was a little bit skeptical uh, of it. Uh, my, my student at the time, uh, you know, kind of confirmed some of the observations that had been made that uh, it's inhibiting cytochrome one of the electron transport chain. And there's, there's uh, it's, it's, playing a role at inhibiting electron flux through the mitochondria in a way that in, in some ways could be producing a, a hormetic effect. And there are a number of off-target effects of metformin. So metformin can potentially decrease inflammation. So that could be a positive effect of metformin. Uh, when you apply metformin to people that are exercising, the benefits of exercise are due to the adaptations that you accrue from the exercise stimulus and metformin seems to attenuate uh, exercise adaptations. So I am not, I've taken metformin for, you know, months at a time and did extensive blood work. And some of my blood biomarkers did improve a little bit. What, what which ones? My hemoglobin A1C was the lowest ever on metformin. It was something like 3.8 or 3.9. Mm. So, and that could be due to, I was also doing more intermittent fasting at the time. Right now, my hemoglobin A1C is 4.3 to 4.4. And it's been like that for a couple of years now. Uh, I brought my weight back up about five to 10 pounds after it went down to like 205. Uh, for me, that's light because I'm pretty tall. Uh, I was doing a lot of intermittent fasting and I felt that I was losing a little too much muscle and a little too much strength. So I started back eating three meals a day, upping my protein. And now, you know, I've gained, uh, you know, a good, about 10 pounds since, you know, a couple years ago, 2000, I guess it's been 2018 to 19. I was doing a lot of intermittent fasting almost every day. And I just could not maintain my weight off, you know, one or two meals a day. And I was eating too much food at nighttime or too late in the day. And it was disrupting my sleep too. So I do feel quite a lot better uh, eating. Like I eat breakfast this morning, just protein, eggs, and some steak. Uh, so in the context of using metformin, what you'd want to do, if you were eating like very large meals, using metformin during those large meals could decrease the postprandial rise in glucose because that could be beneficial and it does have a mild anti-inflammatory effects. And there's a number of studies on uh, cancer. So, you know, 15 years ago, there was no studies on metformin and cancer. And now there's about 180 to 190 registered clinical trials using metformin for prevention of certain types of cancers, particularly cancers that are metabolic dysregulation driven. I guess you would say, and also using metformin as an adjuvant therapy to further augment the therapeutic efficacy of existing standard of care therapies. So that could be chemo, radiation, checkpoint inhibitors, like PD-1 inhibitors, uh, things like that. So metformin is thought to potentially synergize with some of those therapies. And there's some experimental research going on now, at least on clinicaltrials.gov for these types of cancers. So I think there's some application there potentially for cancer prevention. Wow, thank you. Well, thank you for that overview on the metformin and like this whole interview has been very insightful. I learned a lot. I'm sure all the listeners have learned a lot. And if people have questions or want to follow your work or contact you, where can they find you? Yeah, thanks for asking, Inka. Uh, so I have a website, ketonutrition.org. And we're continually working on the website. Uh, so keto nutrition, all one word, dot org. And I co-host the Metabolic Health Summit, which will be in uh, Clearwater, Florida in January, 2024. And we bring a wide variety of speakers, basic science researchers, 
heavy in neuroscience. There's cancer biologists, uh, metabolic physiologists there. We have great keynote speakers. Rhonda Patrick was one of our keynote speakers last year, along with Dr. Jung Ro, who actually introduced the ketogenic diet to me. The, there's a early bird special, so you can get a big discount on the tickets if you purchase now. And so I co-host Metabolic Health Summit. If you Google that, you'll find it. And also we started a podcast that's uh, kind of linked to the summit called the Metabolic Link Podcast. So uh, I am a co-host for that. And really, I, I give, Inca, I give you a lot of credit. A podcast is like a full-time job. <laughs> it's like, I yeah. wish, uh, I, I'm a full-time teacher and also running a full-time lab. So that's why I'm a co-host of it. And my, my other co-hosts do a lot of the logistics, which is tremendously time-consuming and intensive work. But Metabolic Link Podcast, Metabolic Health Summit, and our web, my website is uh, ketonutrition.org. Thank you so much. Hi, I hope you found this episode useful and interesting. If you have any questions or you just want to participate to the discussion, you can find this episode in YouTube and there is a comment box below where you can share your thoughts. I'm always so inspired to read your comments and personal stories in YouTube and all your questions and hear what tips were the most important for you in this episode because this helps me to provide you more relevant information that can also help you in the future so please don't hesitate to come and leave a comment on youtube i also love that many of you come there and share your personal tips and transformation stories because this is all contributing to the community and we can all learn from each other if you're interested in self-care well-being and the cutting edge science on healthy lifestyle and lifespan extension. Make sure to check the other episodes as well and my videos on YouTube and follow my free tips on Instagram.